That's how vulnerable is the pound at this point. And if you want to short the pound, what do you short it against? Um, good morning, and thanks for having me on. So, look, I think, I think given the combination of the news flow uh, and the price action that we've seen in sterling over the last two or three sessions, I think we can. We, it's fair to say Brexit as a driver for currency markets is very much back with a bang. Uh, it's quite something to read uh, Prime Minister Johnson saying that no deal can be a good outcome for Britain, or, albeit uh, we may see this as more of a negotiating tactic as we head towards this self-imposed deadline um, of the 15th of October. We, we've had a lot of questions mm. from clients at J.P. Morgan Private Bank in recent months about why sterling has rallied so hard against the dollar. Uh, but as always in our markets, and in, in answer to your question, you really need to look under the hood to understand what's going on. So at least until the last couple of days, um, sterling has actually been relatively range-bound against the euro since early summer. So what it tells us is that this has really been, um, in the last few months, a dollar-driven move that took cable up to almost 135, rather than a sterling-specific one per se. Now, if we cast our minds back to the, let's call them the halcyon days pre-COVID, we have to remind viewers that rises in no-deal risk had tended to be associated with sterling weakness. So I think we could expect the market to continue to be sensitive to headlines on the topic. Uh, and we should point out that sterling volatility has picked up this week, but it's not close to the, to the extreme levels we've seen. Um, at this point, we do have a preference to play sterling from the short side, but we should stress it's not just the Brexit story. Um, we do see the currency as amongst the most structurally challenged, I think, in the G10 space. Um, a negative real yields, a possibility of, of negative nominal yields, and large external financing requirements. But as you said, the key is how to reflect that view given um, the weak dollar view. So I think our preference would be short against the euro or as a relative value play against some of the other high uh, B to G10 currencies like Norway, for example. And you touched on the dollar. It's strengthening in today's session. But, of course, it has seen this fairly long downward trend. We've seen a move, you said, around diversifying away from those overweight positions on U.S. dollar, uh, according to your notes. To what extent, how much further does that have to play out? Or is that starting to change now? Yeah. We, we have started to see in the last few days um, in FX a little bit of the reassertion of this relationship whereby the dollar has been gaining ground with stocks coming under pressure. But I think we need to avoid some of the short-term noise in terms of equity markets. And I think you allude to the bigger picture of almost a 10 percent pullback in the dollar index since late March. Uh, and from our client base, we've really had an incredible reception around this idea of beginning to diversify away from dollar overweight. And we do think that that's a, a theme that does have legs. So we're not in the camp of this death of the dollar thesis that has been doing the rounds. But we do have to acknowledge, I think, that we've moved um, through this period of U.S. exceptionalism that was characterized by um, strong U.S. growth and an interest rate advantage with attractive U.S. asset markets. And we're now in a different phase of that cycle. Uh, the dovish Fed, we think, is, is a key piece of the puzzle. Uh, so to the extent that the recently um, announced shift in policy last week helps to enshrine a period of low real rates, um, this does provide support for the ongoing short dollar bias. Um, so in terms of how far, how far we may have to go still, um, I think positioning is really key to understand. And it's notoriously very difficult to get a strong handle on it in FX, given how many different types of market participants there are. But we do think it will still take a while for some of the larger asset managers, for example, um, to cover structural dollar longs and turn short. So we do think that um, from a medium and longer term perspective um, you know, is, still, is still a story that has, has room to play out. And Adam, you mentioned about how the market seems to think that this is just when it comes to this Brexit deal and walking away from it, that it's just brinkmanship at this point. But, but doubts are starting to creep in. You see that in the options market a little bit as well. Do you think that if we don't get a deal that emerges by October 15th or even by year end, how long could this route in sterling go? Uh, look, I mean, as I said, I think, I think we are... We have, to, we have to accept now that we're, we're probably back into a market where Brexit headlines are going to be drivers. And, fr and frankly, that hasn't been the case for the last few months where, where COVID uh, and various high frequency data around COVID and, and economic, uh, you know, the, the economic response um, ha have been key. Uh, you know, in terms of potential downside for sterling, you know, I think against the dollar, uh, you know, 125 is something that we have in mind in the shorter term. You know, I think we've been trading. Uh, you know, well above the 130 level, um, you know, for the last month or so. So I think a break of this 130, um, you know, is, is quite uh, important. Uh, and I think if we can hold hold below there, 
uh, you know, I think that opens up further downside for the pound. But look, I, I think I think the, the point is that participants, particularly in Asia, who I think, uh, you know, have got have tended to be quite tired of this story, uh, I think have to be on, on a lookout for, for, for the news that we're seeing in the, in the UK press and for various headlines. I think this, we have to accept that this is going to be a driver that's here to stay at least for the next few weeks now. Yeah, and up until the last couple of days, we've seen people, you mentioned about the positioning of the dollar, is to, to fade that dollar strength. Do you still continue to do a tactic like that, and do you stay within the G10 space? Uh, we, we, we um, overall, I think, as I, as I said at the outset, you know, our, our view is still that we, uh, we prefer uh, to be sellers of dollars on any rallies. And what we think is happening really out there um, or is something that we've characterized as, as a broader trend towards reshuffling of reserve currencies. Uh, so what does it mean? Uh, overall, I think we tend to be pretty positive on things like euro, uh, on yen and on Swiss. Uh, and if we think about what we're, what we're recommending in client portfolios, uh, as I said again at the outset, uh, uh, tending to advise clients to be gently diversifying away from what, at least on our platform, have been relatively long-held uh, dollar overweights uh, and looking to diversify that in, in the way that we would see um, uh, longer-term market players like central banks doing, for example. So, you know, the reserve currencies are things that we've been focused on. Uh, gold, I think we still have a, have a, have a relatively supportive uh, view on that as well. So um, it, it's, it's definitely a story that is, is here to stay. Uh, we would be taking, you know, if we, if, we, if we look at the euro as, as, as really the pivotal cross uh, to watch, I think any dips down towards 117 are to be bought. I think any move, if we get it down to 115, is probably to be bought. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that continues to be our view. So d definitely dollar uh, sellers on rallies for the moment here. Adam, before we let you go, what's your call on the yuan? Um, look, in, in terms of the, the broader theme of dollar diversification, I think we're getting a lot of inc interest, interest, increasing amount of interest in one uh, denominated assets, uh, you know, in the, in the last couple of months. Uh, and I think it's, it's really interesting to see that this move that we had from uh, 7.2 in late May down to a recent low of 6.81, uh, really during that period, uh, geopolitical headlines had tended to be shrugged off or very quickly faded. And I think that's actually quite a, a new phenomenon. So if we look back to earlier in the year, I think clients were much more concerned about hedging that risk uh, in China. And that's, that's really flipped on its head in the last two or three months. Um, I think the case um, for offshore one has been um, supported or continues to be supported by a combination of equity, um, in equity flows and fixed income flows. So we saw record fixed income inflows uh, into China in July, and August was also very robust. Um, so I'd say absent a breakdown of phase one or something fresh on the tariff front, and if we assume that this weak dollar environment um, reasserts itself and investors are looking for yield, um, I, I think we have to acknowledge that um, CNH represents a relatively low vol play um, with almost a 2.5% carry advantage versus the U.S. dollar on a yearly basis. So we think it will continue to perform okay, almost um, as an EM safe haven um, at a time when wider emerging market performance has been more patchy. I think the last thing to say there is, you know, if we do get a Biden victory in November, um, from, our, from our point of view, this would support uh, the positive Asia trade on this idea of potentially less combative trade policy uh, and also some optionality around tariff reduction.